Welcome, welcome to the show, everybody. I want to remind each of you out there to like and subscribe. On YouTube, you can find us at Film Talk Radio. I'm very excited about our guest today, and please welcome to the show, everybody. This is Golnaz Jamshid. Golnaz, hey. Hello, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for taking the time. I'm uh, very excited to catch up with you. We met so many years ago at AFI Fest. Mm -hmm. And uh, please uh, start as early as you'd like to and uh, t tell me in this audience about it, where you come from. Yeah, so um, I mean, it hasn't been easy to be an Iranian living in America, nor an American living in Iran. But um, I would like to start with telling you a story. Um, so picture this as a kid in Iran in the 80s, um, a country where access to entertainment was limited with only a couple of channels on national TV airing propaganda and somber programs. I'm hooked on Hollywood movies. Um, so every couple of weeks, this guy we called uh, Filmi, meaning the film guy, would show up at our door with a Samsonite briefcase filled with neatly organized VHS tapes looking like bars of gold. And um, those films were my ticket to another world. But um, here's a twist. Watching these films was a sin, you know, if... The morality police caught the film guy or even us it was big trouble so that's where my passion for film uh, began and uh, fast forward i um, ended up at ucla my dream school i only applied there nowhere else um, good school yeah ucla was not just a school it was like finally stepping into that world I'd been watching on those VHS tapes. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, that's so, how I always felt. Like, uh, everything that I spent my uh, young life watching on uh, TV was actually in L.A. and New York. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's fun to, you know, visit all these places that you've uh, mostly seen in the movies. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, yeah, UCLA was great. It was very transformative. I um, graduated with a BA in film in 2006. And I actually saw one of your radio talk shows on YouTube with Cassidy Freeman. Um, she was part of my grad project at UCLA in 2005, 2006. So it brought back some memories. <laughs> yeah, she's a wonderful guest. And of course, mm -hmm. uh, you know her from the show Longmire, the yeah. AMC show, and more recently from the HBO show, Righteous Gemstones, mm -hmm. where she steals the entire series. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited to see how she has flourished into this amazing actress. Yeah. So, um, oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> oh, I was going to say, so you're uh, receiving these VHS tapes, which are uh, must be kept secret. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, you know, it's almost like you're doing something naughty to be watching these films. What were some of the films early on that captured your imagination <laughs> that, um, you know, made you feel like, wow, this is something uh, exciting and different and magical? Oh, well, um, there are a lot of there are a lot of titles, a lot of a lot of directors. I'm a big uh, Stanley Kubrick fan, a David Lynch fan. Um, I remember watching Jim Jarmusch movies. I love the grainy black and white quality of the films. Yeah, there, there are just so many. <laughs> and at uh, UCLA, was that being in Westwood and the kind of, uh, you know, it's like, uh, it's, it's like that uh, TV show, Beverly Hills 90210 kind of brought to life in Westworld. <laughs> what were you like there? I imagine you were, uh, very quick to fall in with a uh, with a pretty fun group of people, and uh, and what was that like? What were your friends like at the time? Yeah, I uh, actually got to join this incredible group of thirty undergrads. The um, education we received at UCLA was second to none. 
know, I had the privilege of learning from the best. A shout out to Becky Smith and William McDonald. We were almost the last uh, students to use flatbeds and cutting negative and also being taught Final Cut Pro. So it was like a transition happening. Um, it was about the time where when Walter Murch was um, editing Cold Mountain with a software. So it was an interesting time. And what was your vision at the time? Were you uh, wanting to direct or write or, you know, you you knew you wanted to do movies, but were you as had you fallen into who you would be at that point? Uh, absolutely not. <laughs> I had no idea. I was, um, you know, everything was so new. I um, went to Saddleback College, um, diving into theater, acting, directing, and I always thought I would end up in the theater, but somehow I ended up doing films. <laughs> You know, after I after UCLA, I uh, did go back to Iran, worked on several film productions, um, working with known directors, did a variety of tasks such as direct um, assisting directors and shooting behind the scene footages. Um, but yeah, I guess at the time I was just experiencing uh, different things. I uh, the highlight of those years is attending the master class taught by Abbas Kiarostami. Then I became one of his pupils and his graphic designer, photo editor. Um, um, yeah. And what was he like? <laughs> um, he was very well-spoken, direct, um, a, a decent person, very respectful. The um, lessons I learned from him were mainly through observation rather than direct instruction. Um, he had a unique way of engaging with life, always present and calm against the chaos. So um, I grew up surrounded by nature, climbing rocks and trees, and he taught me to appreciate that aspect of life even more, you know, the uh, simplicity and the um, authentic it offers. And so are you a fan of Ashkar Farhadi? Yeah. Did I say yeah. that right? Yes, Ashkar Farhadi, yes. Yeah, we're very proud of him. And when you're uh, working on these films in Iran, uh, you're mm -hmm. speaking Farsi? Is uh, is the whole cast and crew speaking Farsi? How, yes. how did that work for you? Were you, because you did a lot of growing up in the US, right? So. Mm -hmm. So was your how was the language for you? Is there any barrier there? Um, not not really. I mean, I I was born in the U.S. but uh, grew up in Iran, so I finished high school there, and um, it wasn't difficult to communicate. So you were already fluent, yeah. and you hadn't lost much by the time you were back working on yeah. these films. Yeah. So what's different uh, making a film in Iran versus doing it in the U.S.? What what uh, would could people know about that? Um, the productions are smaller. Um, I think that's like the the the, the only highlight I can. That's think the main of. thing. The main thing, yeah, because I've been on film sets here in California, and it's big trucks and a lot of equipment, but um, in Iran, I've seen it done in a minimal, minimal way. <laughs> what about like the hours that you work or uh, the craft services or catering? Is that similar or? Yes, yes. Food is, uh, is a priority. Everybody loves food. <laughs> and um, yeah, I guess everything else is almost the same as filmmaking here in the US. Well, I guess, you know, I, I see Iran as such a uh, mystical and foreign place, but I, I guess it's kind of refreshing to know that wherever you're shooting a film, you're, 
you know, laying track and uh, doing uh, call sheets and it ends up being pretty much a similar experience. Let's take a short break for these messages, Golnaz, and sure. we'll come back. We'll talk a little bit more with filmmaker Golnaz Jamshid, and she's joining us from Los Angeles. Everybody, stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. Let me remind each of you to like and subscribe on YouTube. We are Film Talk Radio. We're back with filmmaker Golnaz Jamshid. Golnaz, that was so much fun. Tell me a little bit about uh, what happens after UCLA Film School and where your career starts to go as it develops. Mm -hmm. I um, found myself uh, in London and um, London Film School. Um, you know, a big thank you to Abbas Kiorostemi and Sohra Mahdevi, whose recommendation letters were instrumental. Um, it took a year of waiting, but finally I received a full tuition scholarship through the Magic of Persia Foundation in London. Um, yeah, and um, the reality at LFS was different from my aspirations, especially considering my previous education at a high level in the U.S., um, the environment was competitive, which led the led, led to personal conflicts, undermining teamwork. But I guess that was also part of the teaching <laughs> to be tough. Oh, I think so. I mean, tell me a little bit about that. Uh, is that you're all finishing a final project for the semester and you're fighting over equipment and locations. <laughs> and Yeah, I mean, um, there was a lack of elevator in the five-story building, narrow hallways, um, carrying heavy equipment up and down those stairs to classroom stages and locations. You know, it was like um, <laughs> military school. But um, it was an experience of its own, you know, living in a city such as London. I really cherish those years and look forward to going back. And um, we also had like pretty good instructors in the editing department um, and the camera department. We had Andrew Speller and Terry Hopkins. Um, so yeah, I um, graduated from the London Film School with a master's degree in directing and producing. And um, that's it. <laughs> and did that create some opportunities for you once you had the master's degree? And uh, did you find some connections at London Film School? Or were most of your connections made at UCLA? Um, I, um, I mean, I, 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 I still do have the connections to UCLA and, you know, some of my um, classmates at the London Film School um but not that many people stayed within the field of filmmaking after graduation um they i don't know started doing other things <laughs> no i mean i think that's one thing about this business um it's not everybody who survives it and yeah. you know uh one minute you'll be hearing somebody say oh we're doing the most exciting film project that's going to revolutionize the industry and mm -hmm. we're going to reinvent the wheel. And then the next thing you know, they're saying, well, shop at my Et Etsy store. <laughs> you know? So I think it, it mm -hmm. yeah, it does take uh, a lot of perseverance to take these projects to fruition and then beyond that, uh, make it your job. Mm -hmm. So I uh, my, my graduation film from the London Film School, AVO, which had the honor to be screened at the Santa Fe International Film Festival, by the way, I um, also submitted that film for um, the David Lynch film competition in 2015. Um, and uh, I could 
talk about that perhaps a little? Oh, I'd love to hear about that. I mean, I just, I love uh, David Lynch, especially uh, Lost Highway. Um, mm. What's the one with Nicolas Cage about his snakeskin jacket? Oh, Wild at Heart. Wild at Heart, yeah. <laughs> um, Mulholland Drive. Uh, so many of the, I guess, mm -hmm. and uh, even the, what was the TV series? Oh, um, yeah. So during the time, uh, the program, he was involved in shooting Twin Peaks, um, the the newer version, which was released in 2017. I'm not sure if you had a chance to watch that. No, I mean, I was a fan of the Who Killed Laura Palmer when I was a kid. Oh, yeah. And then I really liked the film version too, uh, Twin Peaks mm -hmm. Firewalk with me. Absolutely, absolutely. But I, I still have yet to dig into uh, into the new version of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, yeah, uh, what, what what is David Lynch like? I, uh, I know you got to meet him and work with him and uh, be mentored under his tutelage. Yeah, we um, it was very minim minimal because um, it was a period where his creative energy was, you know, contributing to this iconic series. Um, but we would do um, Zoom videos um, often because, you know, the program is um, located in Fairfield, Iowa at uh, Maharishi University. Um, so we were far away. <laughs> Um, but we had, we had some great instructors in the program. We had a Hollywood producer, Bill Borden, uh, Dwayne Dunham, the editor of Twin Peaks. Um, we had the privilege of meeting Ellen Sandler, the executive producer of I Love Raymond, um, Peter Farrelly, the writer, director of Dumb and Dumber. I met him in Sundance one year. What a nice guy. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Great, great people. And of course, meeting the legendary Jim Carrey at uh, a David Lynch Foundation event in New York, uh, New York City. It was a comedy night. So that was um, amazing. Yeah, was, <laughs> was he funny? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And so tell me a little bit more about the program. Uh, your short film got you selected to participate. Mm -hmm. And uh, how many other people were in it? And wh what are some of the things uh, that you can tell um, tell me about that I don't know yet? Yeah, so I um, was actually, it was summertime. I was vacationing back in California and someone shared a Facebook ad for the David Lynch film competition. <laughs> and um, all of it was submitted along with the usual application requirements. And it was an honor to know that David Lynch himself would, choose the winner. Um, I received a full tuition scholarship from the producer Joanna Polavsky and um, we uh, did a TV series called Next Town Over, uh, which was never released. Um, it was part of the program because the focus was on um, TV writing. And um, from that collaboration actually came my work with Christabel, who played Agent Tammy in Twin Peaks. She's a singer and actress, and uh, together we created uh, two music videos. One is called The Truth Is, with the soundtrack produced by David Lynch, and the other one is Everest, which Christabel and I co-produced. Um, both are available on YouTube. And what was uh, working with her like? Oh, um, she is very professional, very talented. Um, no wonder she's known to be David Lynch's muse. So I anticipate more collaborations with her in the in the future. And how did you feel about making music videos? Was that your uh, first couple that you had done, or had you done music videos prior? Um, the, f the first one we did, the truth is, was actually a scene from the series that we shot for the program. Um, so each, each student um, was to shoot an episode, but we all collaborated in writing the entire series um, called Next Sound Over. And uh, I used the scene um, from that series and turn it into the music video so that was fun 
but uh, I always wanted to do music videos, um, you know, and, and even commercials, which I, I did a few smaller things in Iran, but yeah, there are all these experiences are amazing. It's, you know, practicing the craft. Yeah. Um, God, I think that's uh, a really exciting place to be where you're getting the chance to you know, work on all these different, work in all these different ways with David Lynch, who of course is finishing this series that's about to premiere at the Cannes Film Festival. Mm -hmm. And, and this is after you uh, finished at London uh, Film School that all this yes. is happening, right? Yeah, this is uh, around 2015, 16. Yeah, that was like right when uh, you and I met for the first time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we met at AFI um, 2017. <laughs> oh, it was 2017. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, atop the Roosevelt Hotel. <laughs> during. Oh, the yeah, that was a fun party, party huh? Yeah, the festival's closing night. Yeah, absolutely. Golnaz, uh, I'm really excited to hear about uh, you working under the tutelage of David Lynch in this program. And so you finished at UCLA, then done your master's in London, and you're becoming very versed. And then you're selected for this um, highly competitive program uh, that David Lynch runs. Mm -hmm. And then you go on to uh, do these two music videos. Um, it kind of comes out of the program. And then where where does that leave you at that point in your career? What, what comes next? Uh, I was eager to make uh, my first feature film. <laughs> so I had initially planned to shoot a semi-fictional feature film in Iran, but my lead actress unexpectedly left the country. And while I was in the process of finding an alternative replacement, uh, COVID-19 pandemic happened. <laughs> and so um, I guess a lot of people can relate to that. <laughs> um, I, during quarantine, I found myself in a unique situation um in a secluded serene mountain village um surrounded by minimal sound and noise and i had the opportunity to self reflect read and write and um ski <laughs> snowboard of course um and, and this is uh in the mountains north of tehran yes this is in a village called shemshak <laughs> it's uh known as the aspen of iran <laughs> <laughs> well, I bet there are some fuzzy boots there. <laughs> so you're uh, mostly skiing or mostly snowboarding? I uh, grew up, I learned skiing um, when I was seven. And when I turned 18, I switched to snowboard because that's what it was the cool thing to do back then. But uh, yeah, so ever since I've been snowboarding. So you're shredding this Aspen of uh, Tehran, or do you say Aspen of Iran? Yeah, it's, it's, it's the north of uh, Tehran. <laughs> and uh, they're getting a ton of snow. It's a very good year. And plus, there's not a lot of other stuff to do. Like, are the, the buses mm -hmm. are not running or um, how, how was there any difference between the way these uh, lockdowns were done in in america versus tehran or was pretty similar no it was it was or not Iran, me. <laughs> yeah it was um it was unlike many other experiences it was very unique um but that's actually when i stumbled upon a farsi translation of um i wish someone were waiting for me somewhere by anna gavalda um in um one of my mom's books and um the book is a selection of uh, short stories among which pregnant uh, resonated with me that's uh the recent short film that i made and um yeah and what, could you repeat that title yes it's uh called i wish someone were waiting for me somewhere by anna gavalda 
Oh, no, the title of your short film, excuse me. Oh, um, yeah, so it's uh, based on the uh, short story called Pregnant. Now, uh, tell me about the experience making that short film. Like, uh, is that, or is that one you're still developing? Uh, no, so, um, for, I mean, for years I wanted to create my own interpretation from literature. I've previously explored this concept with my short film, A Woman at a Piano in 2013, inspired by uh, a Vermeer painting at the National Gallery in London. The title is um, a woman, a young woman seated at the virginal. Uh, so when I read this, uh, when I was reading this book, this particular short story um, resonated with me. And the visual narrative made me feel as if I stepped directly into the protagonist's um, skin. And the story's minimal dialogue, which I love, <laughs> inspired me to you know, adopt and produce this um, film based on the short story. I think that's a, a really wonderful skill to be able to have. So when you're reading something and you think, this could be a movie or I could adapt this into a movie. Tell me a little bit about what goes on in your mind then. Um, are you reading stuff always thinking I could find something to produce or is it something that grabs you in a specific way that speaks to you and makes you think, oh, I could produce, this could be a film? I um, I mean, I had it in the back of my, my mind that I always wanted to do this. I mean, I watched films that come out or like series um like like the recent series on fx called shogun i remember watching the old series uh, when i was little <laughs> and that was um based on a book that my dad used to read so i've always known like you know been following films that are based on um literature and i was always fascinated because i felt like you know a writer has also already created this world and you know i'm recreating something based on that, uh, like an interpretation. Uh, so that always fascinated me. Yeah, and so once you've got, uh, you've got the rights to the story or the book mm -hmm. and you're adapting it to a screenplay, how does that work? Yeah, um, thanks to my friends in Paris, <laughs> Mona and Bernard, I was able to locate the author which took months and um, get her consent for the adaptation. So that was amazing. And um, I mean, I guess the main reason I made this film was my own sanity because this was done during the second year of, of COVID and everybody was so thirsty to work and uh, filmmaking is a, is a craft that requires continuous practice. Uh, that's why photography has been a big part of my life. You know, it's to keep training the eye and um, you got to keep doing it, finding flaws and strive to become a better filmmaker. So this um, project is, was a form of practice. You know, I was investing in myself. <laughs> well, and I love that it grew out of this, um, you know, very interesting time in our recent history and I think a lot of uh, it was the catalyst for a lot of create creative ideas and revisioning of different parts of people's lives. This show, in many ways, was born out of it because at the time, um, podcasting and YouTube shows uh, recorded on Zoom were finally becoming very uh, popular compared to what we had seen prior. And uh, Gary Farmer and myself had been talking for, you know, many months uh, in 2020 about, you know, we should start, we should not, we didn't call it recording, we should start broadcasting, we should get on the air and start doing a show. And the concept we had thought of was more, uh, we would read the news and, or I would read the news and then Gary would react to the news. And then when I got offered this show by uh, the radio station KTRC 
in early 2021, I, of course, called up Gary and said, hey, you know, we, we could do this on the radio. And it uh, gave us a chance during a time when there was uh, not a lot going on. And it was weird all throughout the year of 2021 because New Mexico didn't really uh, reopen until the spring of 2022. So we spent a lot of that time recording a lot of shows and kind of dialing and honing what the show would be. And so I, I'm familiar with that kind of period where it's all of a sudden really easy to get on a phone call with somebody because everything's canceled and uh, your favorite show isn't airing and you can't go to the bowling alley or the tennis court or whatever it was. Do you think that um, it accelerated your opportunities to have meetings and uh, get some of the business of uh, making this short film done? What was that like um, in Iran in 2000 or 2001? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, quarantining and not socializing wasn't wasn't easy at all for any any one of us I'm sure and um I guess I mean the the film the pregnant the story it kind of symbolizes the uh that closing chapter um uh, in that chapter of my life you know the the narrative it presents of pregnancy is the loss of an unborn child and the cycle of life that m marches on, uh, you know, the process of creating, losing, and yet continuing to create mirrors the very essence of life. And I guess that's why I, you know, the story resonated with me. It, it came out of, you know, that time during the quarantine. Um, it's been great, but I, I've also worked as a freelance photojournalist since 2004. Um, covering prestigious festivals such as Toronto International Film Festival, Sundance, AFI, where we met. And I've gained a deep understanding of the nuance of film festivals and, you know, the broader landscape of cinema, which has been an amazing experience. And I hold um, immense respect for the organizers of film festivals, for their ability to manage <laughs> schedules, you know, coordinate venues, and bring together this uh, diverse, um, you know, these diverse elements to create a seamless experience. So that's been a amazing ride. And you do a lot of traveling to them. Um, um, you're attending these parties and events and you're, you can be, uh, you know, very outgoing and social but that's maybe not, doesn't come so immediate to you. Was, uh, you know, going all over the country to be at these different festivals as a reporter and as a filmmaker, how did that, uh, how was that socially and as far as making friends, what was that like? Um, I uh, am more of, a, of an ob observer rather than, <laughs> you know, making a lot of friends but um I mean it's, it's just it's been very inspiring to be in that at atmosphere and of course I got a few um business cards and emails and I've been you know social networking with certain people including yourself <laughs> so that's been fun yeah I I mean I I just when we met I thought you were like the most uh charming dynamic a uh, young lady who, you know, just was going to take the world by its reins. And I, I imagine a lot of uh, a lot of uh, your cohorts along the way gravitate to you in the same way. We didn't get a chance yet to talk about censorship. Um, can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, so. Um... Because it it actually it does affect me and my work and you know most of my ideas and scripts push the boundaries too far um, you know crossing the let, red lines 
this is in order to, you know, make films in Iran. And um, as a result, I have many projects shelved, you know, that must be made in Iran, but I can't under the circumstances. So it is crucial for me to address censorship um, since we have this amazing platform, thanks to you. Um, you know, creativity, um, censorship drains creativity, you know, it's the death of an artist. And in Iran, people are born into censorship, which extends to daily life and personal freedom. Um, it's as if, you know, Iranians are trapped in a series of nested dolls, each layer representing a different form of confinement. And uh, well, these, you know, in institutional uh, or self-imposed censorship and this, you know, has, has not only left the society struggling with its identity, but it has also distorted the reality, you know, in the Iranian films, especially in depicting life, women and um, the nation's history. It's like, uh, imagine um, it's, you know, such a buzz buzzkill to constantly weigh and second guess every scene and aspect of your script, um, wondering if you'll be able to bring your vision to life. And, um, you know, unfortunately, some filmmakers cave to pressure and sometimes compromise the integrity of their work. But then we have exceptions like Abbasikyo Rostemi, uh, who sidestepped censorship while you know respecting the audience's intelligence and um i often wonder like how do i explain to my kids that what they see in these iranian films being produced in iran isn't necessarily how things truly were and um so you know as a filmmaker my goal is to present an authentic portrayal of life in iran and I refuse selling my soul to the devil because once you do, it's uh, the devil's advocate. And um, yeah, I mean, ultimately every filmmaker must consider their personal values and artistic goals when making decisions about their creative work. But um, what I'm trying to get to is that censorship influences the films that are being showcased at festivals. And um, I acknowledge that many festivals express solidarity with Iranians and their filmmakers. However, it's uh, primarily through these platforms that films which misrepresent women in life in Iran are introduced to the world. So um, in a sense, I'd like to hear your perspective on this. <laughs> <laughs> well, and first, these are your future kids you're talking about. You don't have any yes. kids yet, right? No. <laughs> but I often wonder, I'm like, you know, if, if I'm to show them these films, that they would, you know, imagine that that's how we live. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm a little bit aware of the news about Oscar Farhadi and some of the uh, Iranian filmmakers that weren't able to attend uh, the Oscars uh a few years ago yeah but i guess more uh, my perspective is about the censorship in the u.s and i think what mm -hmm. you describe is something that uh we do here all the time too which is self-censorship so you're doing something creative like uh the show that we're doing now for example mm -hmm. there are certain things that um if we say them um, then uh we'll have to cut them out of the show because uh, YouTube will throttle the views on it or, you know, it may be a little too racy for local radio on this family mm -hmm. station that we're on. But I, I think the idea that uh, state censorship, which I think is what you deal with a lot uh, overseas, is now becoming more and more prevalent in the US when it comes to uh, the censorship of uh, Newsweek publishing the story about Hunter Biden's laptop mm. or, you know, uh, various different things that are censored here in the US. Um, we have a group called the Motion Picture Association of America, which will, you know, slap a 
a political or racy movie with a NC-17 rating, you know, which means so many theaters won't play it, which means, you know, it can only be played after a certain hour on cable or all these different restrictions. So when you're self-censoring, making a film, writing a film for to be shot in Iran, do you not find yourself self-censoring uh, much at all when you're doing a film for the U.S.? Um, it's because because like for instance, the last script that I was writing for Iran, I like was constantly tense of you know tense because of I was like, oh, I can't put this scene you know in this in the film like you know, and there's like this constant tension that you're afraid that this is the scene is not going to make it through the cut or your film is going to be banned after you make it so it's you know it's really devastating i don't think that that's what we go through here in america because <laughs> right now i'm almost you know finishing i think my masterpiece and um i've planned not to shoot it in iran but in the um neighboring countries so i'm writing freely without you know any constraints or worries so i think i guess yeah, that's the difference and and few films have been banned in the u.s but the u.s government has banned films uh notably uh salt of the earth which was made here in new mexico and you know that was uh more of them going after what they considered communist propaganda. Mm -hmm. But anytime, uh, anytime there's something that's politically dangerous, it's uh, suppressed. And mm -hmm. um, you can see it as recently as Jonathan Glazier's Oscar acceptance speech, mm -hmm. where, you know, he's won the highest award that the movie can win here but the media is treating him like he's uh, a leper because he um, spoke out about, he had an anti-war message that was political. Mm. But tell me I about uh, your future. Oh, go ahead. I said, I, I guess we have that everywhere. But um, one more thing um, that caught my attention actually when um submitting to festivals was the emphasis on um identity <laughs> i don't know if if you i mean if you've seen that or not it's um um let me think it was so it's like they ask about your sexuality as well as your nationality yeah, that's becoming yeah. more uh, more and more prevalent in uh, in grant applications yeah. and different things you're applying for in the U.S. Yeah, it, caught, it caught my attention when submitting uh, through Film Freeway for Pregnant, my short film, and uh, you know I noticed a trend where in these forms you know it requests that not only you mention what your nationality is but also your sexual orientation it, it makes me question whether you know one should benefit from their identity and you know rather you know, than... I, I i think we both come from a time when that was private yeah but i think the idea now is that these are underrepresented groups and by identifying themselves in an application like that the people reviewing the uh, movie or the application can then make an effort to be more representative of, you know, people with, uh, you know, different genders or sexualities. Yeah, I mean, I don't like to exploit my identity as a Middle Eastern female filmmaker. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there's, uh, it's such a rare opportunity to be a, Middle Eastern female filmmaker that I, I think anytime you get to highlight that we definitely should. Golnaz, that's a show. So uh, is there anything else you can tell me before we go? Where, What's your new feature and how can we find out more about how to support your work? Yeah, so I have three projects brewing. One is a documentary called Snow Girl. Um, 
uh, focused on that small village, the Aspen-like village in north of Tehran, Shemshak. It's a story about a young female athlete and her journey to the 2026 Winter uh, 2026 Winter Olympics. And um, I'm hustling funds and grants for that one. And I also have a series titled And God Said to Abraham. It's set in America, centered around multicultural family blending American and Middle Eastern roots, <laughs> obviously. And the pilot script was selected as the quarter finalist at Vail Film Festival, their screenwriting competition in 2023. So that is circulating in screenwriting competitions and um, finishing writing my masterpiece, um, this feature film. Is something out of the ordinary, unlike anything you've seen, especially not in Persian cinema. And it's um, inspired by true stories and personal experiences. But for security reasons, I can't spill any more beans, <laughs> not just yet. Now, have you yet skied in Vail? No. Okay, so I really hope uh, you get to go to the Vail Film Fest. I. I think it's actually in the spring, but mm -hmm. at at some point, uh, I hope you get to ski there. I hope you and I get to do a, a snowboard yeah. uh, day. There. I actually wanted to attend the festival um, after, you know, and God said to Abraham became the quarter finalist. I was uh, planning on attending the festival and ski at the same time, but driving to Vail was like, a long drive from California <laughs> and you know last minute I was like mm, no <laughs> it's a long drive from Denver and I-70 is uh pretty it can be pretty scary you know because mm -hmm. there's semis everybody's going like 80 85 miles an hour and then it's a blizzard so <laughs> it's not for the faint drive faint of heart drivers so Golnas, thank you so much for doing this. I just really enjoyed catching up with you and okay. I'm so excited for your uh, forthcoming projects and for the uh, couple of prior projects that I haven't got a chance to see yet. Everybody, this was filmmaker Golnaz Jamshid and we'll see you next week.